So one thing I wanted to ask you about Montessori uh, is around experiential learning. We know, like we hear so much now about how important that is mm -hmm. uh, and how it actually, from the neuroscience perspective, it actually changes the way we learn. Mm -hmm. And we feel that, you know, schools don't do that enough. So I'm wondering um, what makes Montessori so different? Well, right off the bat, I'm going to say movement. The children are not just sitting in one spot all day. They are moving all the time. Every activity that they do involves some kind of movement. Um, and when we, when we do activities with the children, for example, if I'm doing the pink tower, which is just around the end of that shelf there, I would have the child, it's a, it's a work that we do on the floor, so the child has to have a mat, to, so that designates their workspace, so that everybody knows that's their workspace. They, and I would have them put their mat far away from the pink tower. And there are 10 cubes of the pink tower. They're also, you know, the cubes are this small to begin with, and then this, this big by the 10th one. They're getting a very um, um, sensorial impression of how the size is changing as they bring each cube, and the weight changes also. Um, they're having to negotiate around tables and chairs and other people working and managing to get to their mat. There are games that we'll play, what we call memory games, where we have, um, let's say, something called the color tablets, where they're matching two, two of the same colors. One set will be on a mat here and one set will be on a mat here. And we will say, you know, I, can you go and find me the pink one? Or let's say, that, let's say we're doing the graded colors, where we're getting seven different shades of uh, blue. And we're laying them out and we're starting with the darkest and we're getting to the lightest as we go. And we're saying, now when you walk from that mat to this mat, I want you to go around that shelf and around that table. And I want you to stop at so-and-so's table and I want you to say something to them or tell, you know, give them something to say. And then come back to your mat and make sure that you've brought me the, the next uh, grade of shade. So we've, we're, there's a lot of movement there, but we're also building a memory because we're not just saying go from point A to point B. When they can do that well, then we add these little bits to it. So we're adding the movement, we're adding the memory, where because now that they've stopped and talked to someone, can they still remember which one they were supposed to get? So that's, that's part of our, and that's, that's brain work, right? Um, but the movement is the key. And the, 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 the lifting of those cubes, especially for a three-year-old, that big, that's biggest one, is, it's heavy. And we're saying, you know, try not to drop it because if you look down right below that, that's your toes. That's going to hurt if you drop it, right? So we're, we're, the whole body is involved in carrying this one cube across the room. That's huge for a three-year-old, right? So that's a lot of our materials are, are, are that way where we're asking certain things, where we're saying sometimes, can you put it down really gently? Now, yes, our objective is not to have too much noise in the classroom, but our main objective is, can you get that muscle control so well that you can put that down without making a sound that's what i'm after right I'm not saying that to the children in my mind i know and i'm and i'm seeing a child bang and knock things on and thinking okay we just need to refine some of that right so we're, we're constantly thinking about what's happening with this little body why are we not why is he not able to control what he's doing and what are we going to do to help right that's a huge focus for us and we're trying to sort of align this person we're giving them all sorts of sensorial impressions. They're touching things, they're tasting things, they're listening to things, they're playing sounds. Um, you know, that's just the sensorial material. We're, we're refining the way that they're taking things in. So we started by teaching red, yellow, and, uh, red, yellow, and blue. And then we've gone from, the, so those are the, the primary colors. Then we do the secondary colors, which are all the shades that can be made with red, yellow, and blue. Then we do the tertiary where they're grading each color. Right? This is a refinement. So where we first, at the beginning, when they first came, we were saying, can you find me something blue? They can find anything blue. Where we get to the point where we say, okay, but this particular shade of blue, can you find me something that shade of blue? And now they're not just looking around the classroom, but they're starting to see the differences. You know, that shade of blue and that shade of blue, okay, that's different. Right? So they're, they're, they're ordering how the, how the environment looks. And our, our goal for that is, when they go out there, like if we look out that window, there are so many shades of green on those trees. Isn't that fascinating? So now when I go and sit down and draw, make a picture and I want to paint all these trees, I know 
just by experiencing what I've done in the classroom, that there are different shades of green out there, and I will translate that into my artwork. Right? So that, those are the sorts of activities or the sorts of experiences that they have in the classroom. And of course, then you have all the, the, the very concrete academic stuff that we do, so that when we, do, when we teach them the sounds of the alphabet, we use a, a, le, a piece of wood that has the letter in it on sandpaper. So it's a very tactile feeling. And Dr. Montessori, you know, developed that and had the children trace the, the so they're, they're making the memory with their fingers, the muscles, the touch of it, and they're actually saying the sound. They're also looking at what it looks like. So there's a lot of um, different cognizant skills going on there that are happening all at the same time. Um, and in fact, 100 years later, they're saying that there's actually a direct pathway between, you know, and the, the linking the sound to it. So she was brilliant in that way. She, the things that she came up with are now proving are the optimal way for a child, especially a three to six child or a zero to six child. This is the optimal way for, for them to develop because we're touching on so much. Our, our goals are brain development, right? We're, we're developing a whole child. We're developing the body, we're developing their focus, we're developing how they see things, we're developing how they hear things, all of it. We're developing all of that little being in this room. It's incredible. And just, just because I find it so fascinating when you, you spoke about it, and, and I've seen it with my daughter, how excited she is with, with words and letters, because um, I, I find it it's so different in Montessori how, how children are, approach um, handwriting mm -hmm. and, and the different steps that you were telling me. Yeah. Yeah. So in North America, they do everything starts with print. And when I did my Montessori training, it's all cursive. And so I just thought, okay, well, it's, you know, it's because it started in, in Italy way back in the early 1900s. It was normal, right? But then I started to research it a little bit. And when you, I, in fact, I had my daughter at the time and she was 18 months and she would want to sit next to me. She'd sit in her eye chair and I'd be doing something on a computer or whatever. And she'd have a pencil and she, and I started to watch her and I realized her, this was what she was doing all the time. Obviously, she's young, she wasn't creating anything, but the movement never stopped, it just kept on going. And I started to look at it and I thought, oh, you see, the cursive is a flow. It's a flow to the way that we write. When you have to keep stopping and starting, it's actually hard on your arm, right? Eventually your arm gets used to it, but why not continue the flow? And it feels really good. I started to, I went back to doing my own writing in cursive because I had developed this sort of half, you know, growing up in Africa, British way of writing, going to North America and not really being able to do the cursive script to this kind of mishmash of stuff. And I started to think about what I was doing and I started to actually enjoy the process of writing. And I started to enjoy, you know, when you, when you, I started to realize that if I had my, my, my wrist lightly on the paper, that I could actually just keep moving my arm. Because what I found, I was doing this and then I would kind of stop and, and then I would, I wouldn't pick up my pen, but I would stop and move my arm. And then I realized I could just keep it lightly and I would, could continue, but that takes muscle control. And this is what we're developing, right? So again, even in handwriting, we're developing so much of the child. And look at what we're creating. How beautiful, how beautiful their script is when they write. At the age of four or five, right? Even the three-year-olds are doing it on the chalkboard. It's beautiful and they feel so good. And the steps are, first they, they use... That they trace with a sandpaper letter, um, and then um, they can trace in sand. Sometimes we'll have a, a tray with sand in it, and they can just use their fingers to trace the letters in that. Uh, and then they can go to the chalkboard. And for, for my style particularly, I keep them on the chalkboard for a long time. Because if you do something on a chalkboard and you make a mistake, you just erase it and it's gone. Right? There's nothing worse than it being on a piece of paper and you're erasing and you're erasing and you eventually put a hole in the paper or it's all black because the eraser wasn't clean, whatever. You know, it's a frustrating thing. So for me, I like them to, I like them to spend a lot of time on the chalkboard. But I also have them draw shapes on the chalkboard and we do numbers on the chalkboard. So a lot of their development for me is on the chalkboard because I want them to be satisfied with what they produce. Right? I want, and, and one of the things that I, not all Montessori teachers do this, but I do it, I don't allow them to have an eraser in the classroom. So that when they're writing, if they make a mistake, we just put a little X through it and then we continue. They don't like the way it looks. But if they can erase it and it's gone, they're not going to be careful every time they try. And they're not going to use that muscle control that we've been developing all this time. 
right? So, no, no eraser. We've done it on the chalkboard. We know you can do it properly. Yes, it's a bit different because now it's smaller on paper, but it's okay, you can do it. And they will be careful and they will do it beautifully and they are so proud of what they've done. So then the next step is paper. And eventually they can make books. So if they're studying, say, the parts of the tree, so they've done the pictures, they've looked at all the picture cards and they know the branch, the roots, the, the uh, leaves, the trunk, they know all that. Then they go to the chalkboard and they're able to draw all of that. And we go through the cards and we say, okay, here's the picture that shows us the roots of the tree. The tree that you've drawn, does it have roots? Yes, it does. Okay, here's the trunk. Does yours have a trunk? Yes, it does. So we go through the cards to make sure all the parts of whatever they're doing is there. Then we might go to the chalkboard and say, well, let's see how we write the word tree. And we'll practice doing that and we'll practice writing all the parts. And then let's, let's make a booklet out of it. And that's something you can take home and you can show your parents. Look, I know what that is. That's a branch and I wrote that down. Right? So it can, it can, and then the other part too that, that is also um, great for the children and great for their fine motor skills is to do it with sewing. I had a little girl a few years ago that was studying the ladybugs. And she said to me one day, I said, you know, would you like to make a book about your ladybug? And she said, no, I want to do a sewing. And I said, okay. So I kind of went home and thought, what am I doing here? So I, I, you know, we found all the felt that we could and she created a leaf. So she cut out the leaf. She sewed with a different color green. So here's the color now. She showed a, different, a darker shade of green. She sewed the veins, all with a straight stitch. And then she cut the little pieces for the ladybug and sewed it on. And she said, well, now how are we gonna do the dots, the spots on the ladybug? And I said, well, I'll teach you how to do a French knot. So we did a French knot and there was her butter. She, I mean, it was beautiful. Her ladybug was beautiful. I've got pictures of it that I keep every once in a while. I look at it and think, yeah, this isn't just another way to express what she's learning.